Good afternoon and welcome to the BH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned into the power of post processing with Luminar Neo and Luminar Ambassador Jim Nix. Jim, how's it going? Hey, how are you? Uh, it's going super great. Thanks for having me. Now, a pleasure to have you on. And for those of you who missed what we had going on last week, we did have Jim up in New York City, took him around the streets of New York, had a wonderful photo walk. So we're going to be seeing some of those images today. But Jim's digging into the catalog. He's going to show you guys about the wonderful Luminar Neo software. So I'm going to let him get started. Uh, this is going to be interactive, so don't wait until the end if you guys do have any questions. Feel free to get them in when Jim is going over something or if there's a particular question you had on, on a photo or on something he's doing at the time. Feel free to drop it into the comment section. A special welcome to everybody joining us across the internet and especially on our YouTube page streaming now at b &H Event Space over on YouTube. Jim, I'll send it over to you. A huge thank you as well to the Skylum Luminar team for sponsoring this wonderful two-part event. Jim, take it away. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can get into Luminar Neo. Just to let me know that you can see that okay. We are good. You got it? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks everybody for showing up and hanging out today. I appreciate it. As Derek said, this is super casual. So I'll just be chatting about photography. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you come up with uh, about technique, about what I did, maybe what I didn't do, and maybe would improve if I went back and shot a place again. Uh, you know, obviously about editing and, and all that stuff. And I love sharing my thought processes and editing tips and tricks, which I do a lot on both my newsletter, which is available on my website, jimnix.com. That's J-I-M-N-I-X.com. And uh, on my YouTube channel, you can just find me there at Jim Nix. And uh, by the way, on my website, if you do join my newsletter, I also offer a free preset pack for Luminar Neo, as well as a free ebook about getting the most out of Luminar Neo. So feel free to check that out if you're interested. What I want to do today is walk through and show really the power and the, uh, the kind of fun, frankly, that you can have and the things that you can do with Luminar Neo. There's frankly quite a lot, and we're going to dive into some of that. So I'll go ahead and start with this image here. I need to actually move my zoom screen because it's in right in the front of my image. Uh, okay, so there we go. And I'm going to go ahead and click on edit. I was in the catalog view, which is you can use the catalog. I won't be diving into that today. In fact, let me just go back and give you a quick visual tour. So this is a folder called BNH Webinar. I've got 12 images in it, as you can see here. I've got some other folders here as well, but you can add folders to the catalog and kind of babysit your images, manage them here from this view. If you click on an image, you can then go to the preset tab. If you'd like to select a preset, you can create your own presets. This is a my presets. And so you can see as you hover over them, it starts to show you kind of what these presets will look like on your images. And of course, you can click over to edit to get into an edit. Now, I've actually got a preset applied to this one. So actually, let me back out. Let me get back to the catalog view real quick. Let me just make sure that's reset. Okay, yeah, it's reset. Let me go straight to edit. And my preset is sticking. I don't know why. So tell you what, I'll jump into a different photo. Let me start with this one. Now, this is a photo that I took in Prague. Uh, one of the things I've done a lot is travel. Uh, different cities. I love to shoot cityscapes and landscapes. And of course, uh, as I've already said, I love to edit these photos. And so what you'll find on the right-hand side, you've got histogram, you've got layer properties. If you want to get into layers, you've got crop, and then you've got a number of different tools, including extensions. Extensions are add-on capabilities that would be included if you have a subscription uh, of Luminar Neo, but if you bought it outright, you can get it either way. You can be a subscription customer or purchase a perpetual license, but extensions are add-ons if you purchased a uh, perpetual license. There's a number of different uh, extensions, which I won't be going into today, but it's a nice way to take the really powerful capability of Luminar Neo and add even more power and capability to it, including AI-based noise reduction, AI-based sharpening. And from the catalog screen, I can actually show you over here, you can actually get to HDR, you can get into focus stacking, you can get into upscale and even panorama stitching, which is going to be available this Thursday. It's a brand new feature that just got announced. Let me get back over here to editing. And what we'll do is we'll just dive into some basic stuff. And I'll show you really quickly how you can make an impact on an image. Nothing's been done to this photo, but I'm going to start in develop. And this is really where you start and edit. Uh, I start every photo with develop. 
And just to be clear, if it's a raw file, uh, this one happens to be a JPEG, but if it's a raw file, this will say develop raw. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and you can just, you know, you get your basic kind of things here. So you can bump up the exposure. As you can see, I've got a histogram. One of the things I really like to do when editing is hit the J key. And that will show me with these little red uh, areas here where I have something that's completely blown out. And then if I darken this uh, photo a little bit, you will see there'll be some, actually it'll be better if I darken the shadows and the blacks. But if I do that, you should be able to see, yeah, here's some blue coming in. And you've probably seen this in other products as well. It's basically a nice visual overlay to show you kind of what your image is looking like in terms of the, uh, the really dark parts or the really, really bright parts. I like to use that when I'm editing just as a visual guide that kind of complements what I'm seeing in the histogram. As you can see in this histogram, it's a pretty well balanced image already. So I'm actually going to turn off the J key and just do a little bit of basic stuff here. I'm going to adjust the shadows and the blacks. I like to create a little bit of contrast and to make a little bit of a punchy image and maybe play a little bit with curves just to add a little bit more. So you do have curves here, which gives you all that power and control to really dial in some really specific settings, maybe something about like that. Again, a little bit punchy and a little bit contrasty, but you can see that really quickly, you can take an image that's pretty well balanced, but a little bit flat looking and make it into something that's a bit punchier. And to be clear, I've done nothing with color, but you can see when you adjust the light levels in a photo and create that more dynamic kind of look, which is higher contrast, it does impact the look of the colors in the image. So again, before and after, and again, no color work done, but you can quickly do that. And I'll get into the color tools in another image. I do wanna show you something else. And in fact, um, I'm just gonna reset this photo I'm going to click in the bottom and click revert to original. There's my original. There's a couple of AI tools that a lot of people take advantage of because they're incredibly useful. Uh, one is Accent AI. So if you click on this Enhance AI, you have this Accent AI slider. And it's kind of like the, I'm going to call it the one slider to rule them all. You'll see what I mean when I make this uh, slider go to the right. Now, I don't recommend going to 100. You can kind of get away with it on a photo like this. But if you look at the before and the after with just one slider, I've done a lot to the photo. So this Accent AI, it uh, obviously is using AI, but it does things around contrast and lighting and color. It really can make a photo pop. Again, I don't generally go to 100. Usually what I'll do is go to a smaller amount and isolate it in a photo with a mask. And I'll get into masking in some of these other images as well. But maybe on this one, since it's just a JPEG and it's just a demo, I'll go to 60. Gives me a nice overall look. And you may look at Sky Enhancer, which is kind of acting here like a little bit like a polarizer. Give me a little bit more control over that sky. And then the other AI tool I wanted to talk about that I use all the time is Structure AI. And it kind of basically bumps up a little bit of that edge contrast, gives you a little bit more kind of punchiness, a little bit of a, a texture, if you will. And you can see kind of what's happening to the photo. If I click and hold down this, you can see the before and the after it just gets a little bit more punchy. And again, I will often use this with a masking tool in order to isolate that to certain areas. For example, I might use a brush mask. In fact, I'll just do that right now. I'll click on mask. And as a demo, you've got brush, linear, radial, and mask AI. Mask AI, as the name implies, uses AI and it identifies nine different components of a photo, if, if they exist. It can identify things like transportation, it can identify skies, can identify architecture, things like that. Uh, in this case, I'll probably just use, let's say a linear gradient, and I'll just click and drag, just to add a little bit of that crunch in that foreground. So maybe something about like that. And uh, as in other tools, a linear gradient is flexible. So I can adjust the, the feathering and kind of the fade here. And I can also twist this to adjust the uh, orientation. I think something about like that's pretty good. And if I wanted to, I could come back here and then come in and use a brush and say, well, my linear gradient didn't get up here onto this. So I'm going to come in with a brush and kind of paint in to kind of finish off 
where I want some of that structure to go. So you can do stuff like that where you can combine some of the masks uh, to uh, really be specific and targeted with what you want to do. And uh, you can always come back and dial this back in uh, if you want a little bit more or a little bit less. Um, and in fact, speaking of less, if you wanted to, you could go far to the left, what I call negative structure, and that really softens up the image. I wouldn't use it on brickwork uh, or architecture, but I would use it on water, skies, maybe reflections, things like that. And of course, the boost ladder will come in and kind of amplify what you've done if you really want to get a little bit of a bit more crunch and intensity to that structure, that boost ladder will help. And so there it is before the structure and after. And really just a couple of tools, a really quick edit. I was able to take a photo that looked like that, a little bit flatter, make it a bit punchier. And that's really, to me, one of the things that makes Luminar so powerful and impactful is that you can really quickly just dial in an uh, image edit and, uh, and jump in and, and have an impact. So. Uh, speaking of that, I shot this the other day in New York, and this was in Chelsea Market. Uh, I love capturing. Uh, this is kind of this is kind of in between like a a scene uh, and street photography. I'm not really looking at anybody. I like to shoot a lot of my street kind of photography from behind, where I see people either in motion or doing something. In this case, of course, they were eating. Uh, but I'm going to open develop raw. Notice it says raw this time because it is a raw file. And I'm going to hit the J key again just to activate those kind of blinkies. And so you can see I've got it completely blown out on this light and that light, some on this neon and a little bit of shadow here. So I'm going to pull down the whites and the highlights. And if I don't recover all of this, I kind of don't care. It's not entirely important to me in a photo like this but I do want to even out the exposure a little bit. So I'm going to lift the shadows and the highlights. And you can see I'm getting a pretty nicely balanced image, a little bit more contrast. And the next thing I want to do is get into transform. And this is a really powerful tool that really helps you realign kind of what's happening in your image. So I'm going to take these verticals and I'm going to go slightly left. And you can kind of see what's happening is it's basically straightening up those verticals. Um, I did shoot with this with the 20 millimeter wide angle lens. So 20 is pretty wide. And so sometimes you'll get distortion and that uh, will actually help me fix that. Uh, but I'm also going to use horizontal and that's going to allow me, let me just show you what it'll do. I can kind of swing that left side toward me to kind of slightly reframe the image or I can swing that right side to me to do the same. And I'm actually going to do it that way because I kind of like that look kind of brings them a little bit more forward so that they're a little bit more of the subject, if you will. Uh, slight temperature decrease, slight increase in vibrance, slight increase in sharpening. And I'm going to turn off that J key just so I don't have those overlays. And I think my photo looks pretty good. Now, there's an, uh, an image editing tool called Super Contrast. And by the way, I want to point out, I've got a section up here called Favorites. All you do, if you're down here, if you right click on a tool, you can click add to favorites and then it creates this favorite category up at the top. So if you're looking at Luminar Neo and you don't have these three in a favorites section at the top, it's because you haven't faved them. Uh, I have, that's why they're at the top. And one of my faves, of course, is Super Contrast because as the name implies, it does a really incredible job at helping you balance out the contrast in an image which I love to do. It really helps you kind of pop the light. And as you can see, I'm kind of playing around with the light here. But uh, this tool gives you just so much power and control. And I love how it separates the three different tonal areas, the highlights, the midtones, and of course, the shadows. And it gives you control over the light and all of them. So I'm not exaggerating when I say that I use this on really every image. And in fact, the way I start image editing is I use Develop Raw and then I use Super Contrast literally every time. It doesn't matter what kind of photo it is, but you can see the before and the after. I got a nice little pop in the image and it didn't do much. Those are those tools. I just move the sliders around and experiment. That's uh, some tools you can be scientific about. For me, super contrast is a bit like uh, editing color. I kind of just move things around until I think it looks good. Um, speaking of looking good, I'm going to get into cropping here, and I'm going to use a 16 by 9. You've got all the standard kind of, uh, I'll say, stuff here. Uh, but um, you can also 
slightly adjust your uh, your leveling if you need to. In other words, if you need to straighten the image, um, I'm not sure. I think uh, I think something about like that looks good. And I'm going to pull this in from the side a little bit just to tighten that up and get me a little closer to having this person kind of aligned on the uh, on the grid there for for the uh, rule of thirds. So you get that grid overlay, which I'm sure you are familiar with. Now I've got that photo that looks, I think, pretty good. Uh, there you go. Now it's cropped. Um, sometimes a little bit slower to respond when I'm doing a live. Uh, two more tools I want to use here just to kind of show off uh, what they can do. The Accent AI, I talked about and I showed you that in the last photo. And I want to show you, I tend to isolate it because it does do a lot to a photo and I'm not going to go this high, but I just want to show you as I'm dragging it more and more, I'm getting higher contrast. I'm getting brighter light levels. It's bringing up those shadows. And of course, it's really popping the saturation. I don't want to do that, but I do want to isolate that. So this is where I like to use a radial gradient and just kind of draw this into the center of the image. And I'm going to go ahead and click invert so that I'm focused inside these circular areas, which are now becoming oval shaped areas because I'm adjusting the, the size and shape and orientation. And so I just like to adjust these. Uh, season to taste is something I like to say a lot when I'm uh, making YouTube videos, but that's that's really it. I mean, I just edit based on kind of how it feels. But now I've got that area isolated and I've got a little bit more pop there because I'm applying uh, Accent AI across that. So if I show you the before, you can see it's a little bit darker there. And the after, it's a little bit brighter, a little bit more pop. And I like to complement that with a vignette. And there's a really cool feature in the vignette, uh, and it's called Inner Light. And as the name implies, it allows you to create a little bit of a pop of light in the center of the vignette. Uh, I'm going to go high feathering, and I'm going to go pretty high on roundness. But I like to be able to come in and choose my subject. It'll default to the center of the photo. In this case, I actually want it to be slightly lower and slightly over here. So I'm going to put the vignette kind of there. And I'm going to do an inner light just to pop that a little bit more. And if I show you the before and the after, you can see how it really rearranges the light. Slightly darker on the edges, right? Hence, uh, that's what a vignette is. But the cool thing, I think, is slightly brighter in the center, which kind of accentuates my subject here. But also, I think it complements the light coming off that sign. And shooting handheld in lower light is uh, it's not always a recipe for getting the, the best light balance in a photo, but I think it came out okay if you look at the before and the after. We've adjusted verticals, played with the light quite a bit, played with contrast, played with colors, kind of reframed it even with the, uh, with the horizontal and vertical adjustments that I made. But I think the photo overall really jumps off the screen now. And uh, it's, again, the power of Luminar is just so powerful. And this would be a, uh, not that I advocate hurrying because I don't, I advocate that you take your time and make the photo look the way you want the photo to look. I think that's what editing is, uh, it, it should be like really is just have fun, make yourself happy. Uh, but you can really quickly come up with some really powerful edits in Illuminar simply because it gives you so much power and control uh, over your photos. So there's a, there's a couple of edits. I want to do this one now. This is a street shot, and this will actually, um, you know, this is, uh, you can call it a street portrait. Uh, Derek and I and Stephanie and, and the other folks were out, and we're doing this photo walk. Uh, Derek started talking to these, these guys, and they're like, what are y'all doing? And we were telling them, and so uh, we started lining them up, and they were willing participants. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, this was slightly, um, slightly set up, if you will. Um, but I'm going to come in, I want to brighten the photo a little bit, and I just want to do a little bit of a kind of a basic edit here on, on these two gentlemen that we met on the streets. A um, little bit of sharpening. I think I'm going to come into the optics, see if there's any uh, distortion that can adjust. It is a wide angle lens, so it, I was shooting with the 20 mil. That was all I had in New York, so not always the best lens for getting uh, close to your subject, of course, because it's wide angle, but also not always great for portraits. Uh, but, you know, for this kind of an, an, I'll call it an environmental portrait, I think it kind of works out uh, pretty pretty okay. Actually, I'm not sure I like that vertical adjustment like that. I'm going to reset that to zero. 
let me see if there's any, uh, I think I'm going to leave it like that. And now that I've done those basics and develop, once again, I'll go to super contrast, which I mentioned to you is, uh, is always my number two, simply because it's got such power, uh, so much, you know, gives you so much control over the light. And um, speaking of light, you know, there's really three things I think about while I'm editing a photo. The first one's light. I think about it first when I'm editing, but it's also a constant. So it's it's a common thread. I will focus on the light first to get it right, but I'll go on to other things, but I may come back and edit light again later. So it's light, it's detail, uh, and then it's color. And I generally edit the, uh, those three in that order, even though, like I said, light is kind of a common thread. Uh, but you can um, see, I mean, I've made a little bit of an impact here with that. I'm going to get into cropping. And I think this needs to be straightened a little bit. Uh, so maybe about like that. And I'm going to go into free because I'm going to get rid of some of this stuff up above them and some of the stuff down below them. And, uh, you know, I think. I think that looks pretty good. Go ahead and apply that crop. And what I want to show you now after that crop catches up, there it is, is there's really powerful portrait tools in Luminar as well. There's a section down here called portrait. And this face AI is really cool because it just allows you to go in and it'll help you isolate a face. There's face light and slim face and face light. As I drag this, you will see that their faces, it'll take a second to catch up they'll start to light up. And there you go. You can see it's it's catching that guy on the left. His face was a little bit darker, and now it's a bit lighter. So that's uh, that's come in pretty handy to, uh, to really do that. And you can do eyes and mouth, but they're really too far away for that. But it's nice that it's picking up and adding a little bit of light to that gentleman's face. Uh, and, you know, I don't think that would do a whole lot more to this photo. There is one thing I kind of like, and I don't use it a lot uh, with people in a photo, but that's this dramatic filter because it adds a little bit of a kind of a grit look. But, you know, the scene, the background is kind of gritty. And these guys are in their workout gear and they were cool. So, you know, giving them a little bit of grit isn't uh, necessarily a bad thing. I don't recommend it on a lot of portraits, but street kind of portraits, it can give a nice little punch too. But there it is before. And there it is after. It gives a little bit of crunch, slightly desaturates the photo. So if you look at the before, there it is, and the after. And again, I think I would use a vignette here where I would just come in and I'm going to choose the subject. I'm going to put it right about here, kind of between these two. Um, that's actually pretty much in the center. So that's probably where it would have defaulted to anyway. But I'll tighten up those edges. And like I said earlier, I like a little bit of roundness. And I like some feathering. Uh, and then I like a little bit of inner light. Just got to be careful. Don't want to overdo it and over brighten it because that's already the brightest part of the photo. But there it is before and after. And I think I'll pull that lighting and the center down just a little bit. But if you look at the before and after, you can see quick and easy. There it is before. And there it is after. Quick and easy street portrait. So Jim, That's, uh, Jim, I wanted to jump in real quick. I yeah. wanted to give you a little bit of a chance to get through a couple images because we did have a question talking about post-processing overall, a question from YouTube saying, Jim, thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate. I'm a newbie and I wonder, isn't post-processing cheating? As a photographer, shouldn't you strive for the best image but not alter it? So now is your chance to talk uh, about your opinions on post-processing. Oh, wow. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, considering the fact that I have a YouTube channel dedicated to post-processing, I think it's going to be pretty obvious what my answer is. Um, uh, I personally believe that you should edit a photo however you want to edit a photo and use any tool in every tool if you want to. Um, I do prefer if I put in absolutely new stuff. So if it's a composite or if I drop in a new sky, which by the way, you can do quickly and easily in Luminar Neo. I'm of the opinion that you should disclose those things. And so if you're using uh, adding elements to a photo that didn't exist when you saw it, I'm of the opinion that you should disclose. But as you see here, I mean, I personally think that editing is completely fine. One of the reasons why is that I shoot in RAW every time, and a RAW file does not at all look like what the scene actually looked like with your eyes. The human eye has, and I don't know the number, someone is going to know, but 
something like 15 to 20 stops of dynamic range. So we can see into the shadows better than our camera can. We're going to pick up more variance in color and those kind of things. And I'm completely fine with taking a raw file and editing it to make it look the way either I want it to look, which is generally what I do, or the way I, uh, I experience the photo. And what I mean by that is uh, when I say I like to edit the way I want the photo to look, I'm kind of editing based on feeling. So like this scene, it was a lot brighter than the, uh, uh, the raw file looked like. And the colors were bright and vibrant. I mean, there's a lot of color there. And as you saw, I didn't really even jump into a whole lot of color tools. It just, the natural editing process uh, accentuated the color. But, you know, the camera captured that, but my eye saw something probably more like that. Now, my eye didn't see a vignette, which I did add to this photo. But um, I will tell you that like kind of the really bright areas weren't as bright to me and the really dark areas weren't as dark to me. Um, so I personally do not think that editing is cheating. I think it's allowing you to create an image that either suits your artistic preferences or suits the scene uh, or just brings it back to looking the way it actually looked. Uh, so, you know, everybody's going to have their own opinion on this one, but I absolutely love editing photos and uh, think it's so much fun. And it's absolutely, to me, a critical part of the creative process. Uh, and I also have used just, uh, just use the word creative. I'm of the opinion that, I mean, you know, people always say creative arts, you know, painting, acting, you know, making films, taking photos, right? These are creative arts. What's wrong with exploring your creativity in post to, to bring something to life? Uh, so that's, uh, that's my personal opinion. And, uh, you know, that would probably be a lengthy debate depending on uh, uh, what, what someone else's opinion is, but it's, it's a great question. And I, I personally think it's totally fine. I just prefer to disclose if I do uh, add things to the photo that didn't exist in reality. So how's that? Is that uh, hopefully that answers the question, but yeah, that's a, that's an absolutely great question. Cool. Any others, Derek, to cover real quick? Nothing right now, Jim. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, this is something. So uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to be one of the instructors on the uh, Luminar Adventure in Iceland um, twice now. We're going a third time next month, actually. But uh, last time we went was November of last or October, I should say, of last year. And this is Vesterhorn in southeast Iceland. And as you can see, it was an absolutely amazing sunset. But um, I need to make some edits to the photo, you know, need. Uh, um, and what I want to do is just come in and just make some really basic stuff. And, you know, this might actually fit really nicely with that last question about is editing cheating? I personally don't think it uh, is cheating because I love to edit photos and I, I like to bring it back to look kind of the way that I think it looked when I was there. But you can do really subtle things in your edits that basically just slightly bring up the overall look of the photo and makes it you know, slightly uh, better to look at, let's be honest, but also slightly uh, more realistic, right? So I'm going to do a few basic things like that. I'm going to go into crop and straighten this photo because it is definitely crooked. And, uh, you know, maybe let's say something about like that, I think looks good. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, there's an erase function that removes dust spots automatically. You can see some dust spots here. Uh, that were on my lens or my sensor in this upper right-hand corner and some across the center there. Looks like the straightening just caught up. Uh, but this function, they're using AI to automatically remove power lines, which thanks, thankfully we don't have those in a place like this in Iceland. But I definitely had spots on my, uh, on my lens or my sensor, and that goes in and does that removal for me. Uh, it is taking a moment. Uh, usually when I'm live streaming, things are a little bit slower. But there you go. You can see that's done now. And so those spots have been removed. And I think I would do a couple other minor things here. I think I'd use a linear gradient and slightly brighten some of that part of the image uh, slightly. So I'm going to come over here, grab the exposure slider, bring that up just to help accentuate that reflection a little bit. And then I think I might would use a little accent AI. This is where I talked about target, targeting Accent AI in specific areas. I'm going to use that with a radial gradient inverted here on the mountain itself. I just want to pop some of that, give it a little bit more intensity there. 
So maybe something about like that and give that a little bit of a bump. And you'll see that brings that up a little bit more, makes it a little bit more visible. And that's what I'm talking about in the editing. I don't consider it cheating because my eyes saw it like that. But if you look at the before, you know, the camera captured it like that. And my eye did not see dust spots, um, but, you know, the camera did, right? So you're able to quickly come in and make some edits that really impact the photo. And absolutely, if the, if the uh, you know, one of the things about editing is, oh, I see these unnatural colors or I see you know, whatever it might be. Um, there are definitely unnatural things you can do to photos. And to be clear, I've, I've done those plenty of times in edits where you bring up too much saturation or vibrance, or you kind of go over the top. Um, I, I like to jokingly call those over the top colors, clown vomit. That's kind of what it looks like to me. It's just like, oh, all this color. Uh, I'm, I'm as guilty as, as anybody is uh, for having done that. And sometimes I still do it a little bit. I, I like a little bit of an edgy edit at times, but I also like something like this, which to me is this kind of classic. That's kind of what it looked like. And, you know, before and after. So that's a minor edit that just brings up the natural beauty of the place without really going over the top. And so uh, something I like to think about when I'm editing is what feeling do I want to convey? Uh, and that's where the edit might uh, convey, uh, you know, stuff that wasn't there, which is kind of what I'm going to do in this one. So I'm going to uh, come in here, and this is just a forest scene. I was walking in Oregon with the family. We were on a little getaway and just kind of hanging out. And what I want to do here is just kind of bring up some of the overall look of this image and make it kind of feel the way I want it to feel because it was really a beautiful scene. I love paths in the woods. I like images that have a, uh, everybody likes leading lines, right? So a, a road through a forest to me is a great leading line. And it kind of goes down there and then it turns and you can see that the sky is a little bit brighter. I don't even care, to be honest, if I click the J key, you can see I've got some areas that are blown out. I, I, I don't really care, to be honest, in this case, because I want to accentuate a mood and make the photo look the way I want the photo to look. And so if that's a little bit more blown out in the sky, uh, I'm OK with that. And I'm just kind of playing and I'm kind of winging it here. I don't have a huge plan. I know generally what I'm doing, but I'm not following any notes or anything like that. So just adjusting contrast, there we go, before and after. That's getting a little bit better. And I think what I wanna do is, let's see, I'm gonna do another mask here, linear gradient, and I wanna do something about like that. And I'm gonna uh, increase contrast. I like how that adds a little bit of mood to the photo. It kind of slightly darkens some of that. And I might even pull some of the shadows and the blacks down just to accentuate that. And uh, let's see the before and the after. I think that looks good. I'm also going to do um, a little bit of a dodge and burn here. I'm going to go in and get the brush mask. And what I want to do is just come in here and I'm going to paint in here with my brush. So you can just come in and you can select an area and just kind of paint over it if you want to do a little dodge and burn. Now, there is a dodge and burn tool, but what I will often do is uh, dodge and burn with this masking tool on develop because develop also gives me other things besides just doing dodge and burn and adjusting the light. I'm also able to adjust things like contrast and, and that sort of thing. So I will often dodge and burn just with uh, the uh, the develop tool here. So I'm going to bring that exposure down slightly. See how that slightly darkens that? Give it a little bit of contrast. Maybe about like that. Maybe that's a little too much. Uh, yeah, it's a little too much there. I'm going to pull that back. Don't want to overdo it and make it look uh, completely overdone. Maybe something about like that. If you look at the before, and the after, just slightly darken the center of the path there. And one of the things I love about Luminar Neo is that you can just use this develop tool again and again and again if you want to just keep accentuating the overall mood. Um, so I use it often um, several times in an image, which I just like to do. Um, I mentioned mood a minute ago. The, uh, the mood tool, or excuse me, not the mood tool, the mystical tool actually adds quite a bit of mood. I love what this does to an image. 
you can kind of see this is giving me a nice little kind of, um, I say moody, even though it's a mood tool. So to be clear, the mood tool is for adding a LUT or lookup table, which also can be used in Luminar. So if you have LUTs, um, as long as they're .cube files, you can use them in the mood, mood tool. But the mystical, mystical tool, uh, as you can see here, it adds like some shadow. It's kind of like a romantic lighting tool. And you can see what it's doing to the photo overall. It creates a little bit higher contrast, creates a little bit of interesting um, work in the light, and you can adjust shadows if you want to. I'm actually going to bump them up a little bit, and I'm going to close that, but that adds a nice little bit of a romantic lighting, I think. Uh, and speaking of romantic lighting, I want to go get develop again, and here I'm going to get the masking tool and a radial gradient, and what I want to do is draw a big gradient across the sky, once again invert so that I can be specific and targeted uh, inside. And I need to shrink that a little bit and pull this out. So it takes a minute to uh, to kind of get this the way you want it to look, you know, depending on what it is you're trying to do. It's hard for me sometimes when I'm trying to talk about what I'm doing and then also try to do it at the same time. But let's say something about like that. And what I want to do here is just increase the exposure. So I'm accentuating the look of that sunlight kind of coming through the canopy. And so it's brighter, but it's also going to be warmer. And that's another reason why I like to use the develop tool multiple times, because I can adjust temperature, saturation, vibrance, whatever it might be. Let me try a little bit of vibrance just to give a little bit more of that intensity, maybe a tiny bit more warmth. I just I don't want to overdo it. And I might be getting close. I'm going to give it a little bit of a tint as well. Uh, no, I'm gonna, I'm actually going to tint it the other way, which is going to make it more green. So this is really just creating a little bit of a look of bright, warm sunlight coming in through that canopy as I'm kind of walking down this path. So this is, again, going for feeling, which is not totally real. I'm not adding, well, I'm adding light and maybe some color, but I'm not adding elements to a photo that didn't exist. But you can see a massive change right there in the sky. So before and after really brightens that up, gives it a bit of vibrance and intensity. And then I think I might would just come in here with a vignette just to kind of wrap that up. And for me, when I have a path photo, um, I want to put the center of the vignette kind of where the path is going. To me, the path is kind of heading right into that direction. So slightly off center. And this is where I'm going to come in again with the feathering. I tend to go 100 on feathering just about every time. I like a little bit of roundness. I want a little bit of inner light, which also kind of complements what I did a moment ago with that radial mask in the sky. And I'm just going to tighten up that vignette, maybe pull that in on the edges. And maybe something about like that. So before and after, you can see how it kind of slightly rearranges the light. And speaking of rearranging the light, let me show you the entire before and after. There's a before and there's an after. I mean, an absolutely massive difference in the photo. And if I do this little sliding window, you can see, I mean, I warmed up the photo overall. We played with the light a whole lot. And if it wasn't for me talking, um, it's, you know, it's maybe a 10 minute edit. And like I said earlier, I don't advocate hurrying through your edits. My point is just that you use the tools in Luminar enough, you will learn how they operate and what to use. And you'll start to kind of envision how you want your photo to be and you'll know which tools to use them. So this would be a, you know, five or seven minute edit for me, just taking advantage of all the power and the masking and the color tools and things like that. And you can really make a huge, huge impact in just a few minutes on your images. So I love doing stuff like that. And that is where it gets a little bit on the creative side versus the, uh, you know, hey, I'm absolutely rooted in reality kind of thing. So um, that's, a, that's a nice woodland scene. And um, speaking of, um, I mentioned color a minute ago. I want to show you a photo where I would play up color. Uh, you can see this is a, in Rome. It was, a, it was a beautiful sunset, and I was hanging off the, uh, the bridge in front of the Castle of Sant'Angelo, I think it's called. It's real close to the Vatican. Um, but it's a beautiful bridge and it was beautiful light. And of course, I want to bring up the light and the tones overall. But this is a situation where I would like to play with color 
a little bit and I can show you some of the powerful color tools in Luminar Neo because there are a lot of them. So if you're looking at the histogram, which I like to use, and if I hit the J key, I don't really have any problems there in terms of really dark spots or really blown out spots. So I'm gonna hit that again just to hide it, but I wanna lift some of these shadows and get a little bit better visibility into that photo. Um, for me, when I'm editing, it's a delicate dance here uh, between the con like how much am I gonna lift the shadows and lower the highlights and add back contrast. It's a delicate dance. I'm always kind of moving that around. And as you've seen in some of these other photos, I'm often going back later and doing things that might actually go and uh, go in the opposite direction of what I did when I first started the edit. And um, I, I would not say that my my editing is a straight path from start to finish. It is definitely a winding road, a wandering road. And um, I love that. And it's part of the fun of editing is just kind of having that experience and doing that exper those experiments where you come in and just kind of play around and figure out, you know, hey, what do I want this photo to look like? And um, that's to me part of the fun of post-processing is just having a play for lack of a better word. So uh, I think I'm going to go with that for my starting point on this one. And I think I will go ahead and crop this to a 16 by nine just to get kind of a, a mirrored kind of look, something about about like that. That looks to be about like a mirror-ish. Uh, uh, no, actually probably be more like that, wouldn't it? Yeah, there we go. Um, there we go. I'm going to create kind of a mirrored uh, look and give that a second to catch up. And there we go. And so now that I've done that, I want to play with a couple of things. I want to go with some negative structure. I mentioned that earlier and that I use that a lot on skies and water. So I'm going to come in and do a negative uh, like 40 or so, but I'm going to go across the entire photo. There's a lot of water and a lot of sky, excuse me, but I'm also going to create an overall kind of dreamy look to the image. So negative structure will actually soften up uh, the overall look of whatever it's being applied to. In this case, it will be the entire photo, but you could always come in with a mask and erase it from the trees if you wanted to keep some of that natural uh, texture that's in those trees. So before this tool and after, slightly softer overall, but I'm going to go for a little bit more of a dreamy kind of colorful look. Uh, and I mentioned color. So there's uh, two tools that I use a lot. That's why they're in favorites. One is toning, which you may know in other products as split toning, separates highlights and shadows and gives you a hue and saturation slider for each. There's also balance, which allows you to air more towards what, whatever you do in the highlights or whatever you do in the shadows. In this case, I'm going to go a little bit higher saturation in the uh, in the highlights, and my hue is all the way to the left, which is red. I'm just going to leave it there because I like that look when I'm editing a sunset. I love taking the warmer uh, kind of hue of a split toning in the highlights because obviously that's going to mostly be in the sky, but it gives it a nice little pop of color. There it is before, and there it is now. Uh, the next one I'm going to get into is color harmony. But before I do that, I want to show you a tool. I'm not going to use it on this photo, but it's so good. And it's really great at going in and applying on sunsets. And that's in the landscape, and it's called Golden Hour. So whenever you have those warm tones, if you drag this Golden Hour, you can see what it's doing. It's really giving you a nice, warm look to the tones that kind of are warm already. It's just giving a nice, warm pop overall. So if I show you the before, there it is before, and there it is after. That's a wonderful tool that I use a lot. Now, I'm not going to use it on this tool simply because I want to demonstrate Color Harmony, which has a lot of color tools in it. But I did want to point out Golden Hour because it, it is a favorite, and it's something that I use quite often. But I do want to point out also that I don't want to use it here simply because I'm going to use Color Harmony, which has a lot of color tools. And I think this goes back to getting... Uh, the idea about being careful about being realistic. And that is, if you use too many color tools, and this isn't a Luminar thing, this is an any ed editor, if you use too many color tools, you run the risk of just having a really incredibly oversaturated image with too much going on. So um, I just, I like to be careful. I think one or two color tools is, is often enough, but I do want to demo simply because we're kind of running out of time, how color harmony works. First section here, brilliance and warmth, pretty self-explanatory. And by the way, 
These tools are global, so they apply to the entire image. But of course, you have this masking option on really just about every tool in Luminar. So you can come back in and apply, uh, apply things specifically or targeted uh, with a mask. So brilliance and warmth, I'm going to go a little bit higher. A tool that I love is split color warmth. So as the name implies, um, it allows you basically to separate the warm colors from the cool colors. So on the warm slider, if you drag warm to the right, any colors that are, uh, any tones that are warm already, it will get warmer. But if you drag them to the left, it kind of neutralizes them. You can see it's really going away. So that's a great one for like a golden hour or sunset to give it a little bit of a bump. It looks a little bit like what I did with golden hour uh, a, a few moments ago. So that's what the warm slider does. The cool is it works the opposite. Um, if you go to the left, it'll accentuate and bring more coolness or uh, blue or blueness. Temp you know, it'll reduce the, it'll increase the amount of cool to the to the cooler colors. That's too much blue, but I'm just showing you how it looks. And if I go to the right, it starts to neutralize them. Uh, and so in this case, um, I like the interplay of the cool and the warm. So I might go a little bit cooler, but I just want to be careful not to go too much. Um, and maybe I'll go a little bit higher on warm just to kind of accentuate those uh, colors and their differences. Uh, as you probably know, the kind of the yellow and kind of the blue, they're opposite ends of the color wheel and therefore they're complementary colors. So in a sunset like this, where I have a nice amount of blue and also some nice pop of warmth, I want to kind of play those two colors off of each other because it's kind of visually pleasing. And so there it is before. And this is all of color harmony. So that's both split color warmth and what I did earlier with brilliance and warmth. But there it is before. And there it is now. Uh, and I'm going to hit reset real quick because I want to show you color balance, an incredibly powerful tool that, again, one of my faves I use quite a bit because it gives you so much control over colors. If, if you use this drop down menu, you can see you've got highlights, midtones, and shadows. And this is basically the color wheel, kind of same thing you can do in curves, but in a slider format. So it gives you a lot of power and control. In this case, I would take the uh, highlights. I'm just in highlights. I want to go maybe a little bit more magenta and maybe a little bit more red just to give a little bit of a nice, subtle, kind of twilight kind of look. And you can come into midtones, and I will usually go a little bit less on midtones, if at all. In this case, actually, maybe that's all I would do. Actually, I think I'm going to reset that. You can just double click any tool to reset to zero. I think I'll skip the midtones and just go to the shadows. Uh, and here, I will generally go a little bit cooler in the shadows. It'll make them a little bit darker, a little bit cooler, which will accentuate kind of the warm tones that I played with before. So you can see this is just using color balance. I've got a nice little uh, overall color look to the photo. There it is before and there is after. And in this case, if I wanted to go a little bit warmer, maybe pop that. And if I wanted to bring up those warm tones, maybe pop that. It's getting a little over the top in the sky, a little too much. So I think you got to pull that back. So you do have to be careful, but it's uh, it's incredibly powerful and useful to have that kind of control over the colors in your image. And um, you know, if I look at the before and the after, made a huge impact on the photo. And maybe since I turned off some of those other tools, maybe this is where I come back and pop it with a little bit of golden hour and maybe a slight vignette. And in this case, I'll show you a little trick I like to use. I don't really think I need a vignette here. Uh, but I do want to kind of get that inner light where I can pop a little bit of the center of the photo and brighten it up. So I'm going to choose subject. And actually, you know, I don't even need to. I'm just going to go straight in the center of the photo. Uh, and usually, you know, if you're doing a vignette, you drag it like this and, and uh, that sort of thing. And then I'll pop inner light to give it a little bit more brightness there. But I don't really want any of the, uh, any of the amount. So when I do that, you'll see that my inner light is turned off because I'm using zero for an amount, well, I can just click it and drag it to one or negative one, and it basically turns on the vignette. So at negative one, it's a completely invisible vignette, but I still have access to inner light. So I can just make that kind of pop if I want to without adding a vignette to the uh, to the photo. And actually, now that I've done that, I think I'll actually center it a little bit more over here because I find my eye drawn more to that part of the photo. I feel like my eye kind of comes in at the left and kind of goes to the right. So it comes in, sees a tree in the building and that group of trees kind of reflected. And then I kind of follow my eye across to the bridge. At least my, my eye is kind of doing that. So uh, that inner light kind of popped that area 
uh, you can kind of see how that's happening. Uh, and I don't want to go too high because I'm also brightening up that sky. Uh, but yeah, that's just a little trick I use is to kind of turn on the vignette with like a one or a negative one. And then you can take advantage of that inner light without having to go do a radial mask and all that kind of stuff. So before and after, really powerful and quick change to a photo. Again, these edits take longer because I'm talking about them, but in reality, they're they're quick and easy. Uh, Derek, do we have time for one more? Should I do that real quick? Yeah, go for it, Jim. Okay, cool. Um, how about a night scene? We haven't done that yet, but this is a night scene from London. And this is over the Tower Bridge is off to the right and behind me. And this is a place called the Scoop. And that's the Shard, uh, this tall skyscraper in the distance. But I love shooting cities at night. They're, they're just so photogenic. And I love all the lines and the architecture. And of course, I love the color. Uh, so once again, I'm going to start with Develop Raw and I'm going to hit the J key. And you'll see I've got a lot of blown out areas in these buildings. But a scene like this, I, again, I kind of don't care. I'm going to lift the exposure a little bit and pull down the highlights a little bit and maybe lift the blacks a little bit. And it's funny, there's blue light reflected here and all across there, um, which could be confusing because it looks just like the blue overlay that says, hey, this is completely black, which is actually happening right there. But the rest of this is actually just blue light being uh, reflected. Um, maybe a tiny bit of sharpening. Uh, let me play with these whites just a little bit. I'm actually gonna go a little bit brighter, something about like that. And actually, I think I'll bring up uh, the temperature, or excuse me, bring down the temperature, make it a little bit cooler, and maybe add a little bit of tint to give it a little bit of that color in the sky. Let me hit J key. That's a little distracting to me visually. So, uh, so far, I've got uh, started with that, and I've got to, to this. There we go. So you can see you can have a really powerful impact on the photo in just a couple of minutes. Here, I'll use a little bit of Structure AI, and I'll use that across the entire photo. You will notice it slightly brightens the image, which is, uh, which is useful because it's adding a little bit of crunch, so it helps you get a little bit better visibility into that crunch, but it's also something to be aware of that you don't want to uh, overly brighten an image if you've done a lot with the light and then you're playing with a little bit of detail. Just kind of be aware of that. Um, I think I'll go into a color tool and play a little bit here with Color Harmony. I might do a little bit of brilliance. I might cool it off a little bit, maybe bump a little bit of warmth and maybe uh, decrease a little bit of that coolness. You can see how I'm kind of adjusting these colors, which um, when I'm editing a landscape, uh, with it being a natural environment, I find that th my use of color tools is pretty mild uh, editing a landscape. In other words, I don't create or enhance colors so much that, that it's they're less like they actually were. Whereas um, it's a, a bit of the opposite really for me in a cityscape, I will play with colors and accentuate them and kind of enhance them a bit more than might be considered, uh, let's call it natural. Uh, and you know, to me, that's part of the fun of cities is you can kind of do that without really getting something that looks uh, completely overdone or over the top. Now you may disagree with that. Uh, in fact, I need to pull that, uh, that back just a little bit. But um, I kind of like to accentuate and bring up colors in a cityscape because I think you can make some really beautiful looking images. And there it is before and after. I'm going to try uh, a little bit of the, uh, the mystical tool again. I just like that one. Adds a bit of that romantic lighting. You can kind of see what I'm doing there. I brighten the shadows just a tad. And maybe about like that. So before... And after, you can see how it adds a little bit of contrast, a little bit of darkening, but it creates a nice little bit of mood. Um, and I actually might try, I, I don't know how this is going to look. I'm going to maybe go get a glow and add glow across. Let's see how this is looking. Let's see, glow before and after. You see how that kind of brings up these really blown out bright parts? I kind of like that. It's kind of fun here. I'm going to make it a little bit softer and a little bit brighter. Uh, so I'm basically just accentuating, I'm kind of leaning into the fact that that's blown out. So you might call it steering into the skid, right? I can't do anything about it, so I'm gonna steer into it. And that glow is basically 
popping a little bit of that light there. I don't know, it's kind of fun and it accentuates a little bit of that light there as well. But if you look at the before and after overall, you can see there's before and there's after. And it might look a little bit dark. You could always come back to develop, slightly brighten that a little bit if you wanted to, and maybe put on those highlights a little bit. They're kind of glowing heavily. Uh, and maybe adjust the temperature a tad. I don't want to go too much because I like that kind of magenta, but actually I'm just going to leave it. I like the magenta, but um, season to taste. Some people don't like magenta as much as I do, but to me, that's a really fun edit. It's taking advantage of a lot of the tools in Luminar, doing kind of creative and fun stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's to me a, a fun result. There it is before and there it is after. So I know we only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, are there any other questions, Derek, or do you want me to try to jam in another edit, anything Jim, like that? What do you yeah, think? you could. Yeah, we can move into another one. The the last question that we do have hanging is just on the auto calling software that's out there. Wondering if you use any of that AI based calling software that's available. Good question. Um, I don't really. Um, I um, for for the way I shoot and what I shoot, I tend not to ever really get rid of anything, um, simply because. Um, I never know what's going to happen with software in the future that will allow me to uh, fix or edit a photo to my liking um, that I took years ago that I didn't like at the time. Or I, I'm always making the assumption, and that is that my skills are going to improve as well over time. So I might be able to, if I have a better term, save a photo. And so I tend not to cull. I, I tend to just keep everything. And in fact, I actually had a comment the other day from someone about saying, oh my gosh, whatever you just did to this edit, and I can't remember the photo, but they said something like, I can't believe you just did this to this photo. And I've thrown out so many photos that had that same thing. And I I just threw them out because I thought they were trash and I should have kept them because I, now that I know how to do this, I could have done something with them. So I tend not to cull. Um, but, you know, I think if you're doing events, uh, you know, portraits, things like that, it would certainly be uh, very applicable. Um, and I've used a couple of those products, but I haven't spent a lot of time with them simply because it doesn't really, uh, it's not a big factor for me, I guess, is the answer. So hopefully that helps. Perfect. Perfect. And hey, we got a couple more minutes. Might as well okay. dive into another one. Okay. Here, why don't I jump into this uh, cityscape? Uh, this is Austin where I live. Um, and um, it's uh, it's got a spot, <laughs> of course, got a couple of spots. I'm not going to take the spots out simply because we're short on time. You saw earlier that it can be done automatically, but I just want to come in and do kind of a quick, powerful edit and just kind of show you some of the things that you can do and how you can really quickly and powerfully impact the overall look of a photo and uh, really get a result that I think that you, you may like without spending a whole lot of time on it. So uh, I've already said a couple of times that I don't advocate hurrying and I'm kind of hurrying here, but I'm hurrying because we're a little bit low on time, not because I think that hurrying is the right way to edit a photo. I think take as long as uh, as it takes if uh, if you know if that's what you need um, and I will sometimes kind of put an edit on ice for lack of a better term and then come back and uh, adjust it later and uh, find something that I I think I should have done or would have done differently that sort of thing uh, I'm going to come in and give this a little bit of accent AI and I think about like that I'm actually going to go negative structure across the entire photo I like smoother photos I'm generally not doing too much of that on architecture and um, landscapes because I think man-made stuff and then natural elements like trees and rock are, look good when you add a little bit of crunch, but sometimes I'm in the mood to go a little smooth. Today is one of those days. Uh, I'm going to use Mystical again. It's just a fun, beautiful filter. So again, this is kind of creating a little bit of that overall kind of smooth, kind of moody look. And I think I will actually go into develop again. And I think I'll drop a linear gradient. And I think I will just make that a really wide gradient and come in something about like this. I want to slightly darken the sky overall. And so maybe about like that, give that a little bit more of a frame, for lack of a better word. And, you know, maybe something like that. You know, I don't know. I would probably edit this five different ways if I did it five different times. But I mean, I went from a, what looked like an image that you might say, oh, that's blown out or that's too bright and that's not useful to, hey, guess what? That's, that's actually kind of useful. Uh, there's actually one actually one more 
AI tool to talk about, and that is Relight AI. And it divides the photo. It's kind of like a, a double-sided gradient where I can adjust the depth and I can adjust brightness near. So let me show you. Brightness near, you can see if I go really high, which I wouldn't do this, but if I go to, I'm at 85, you can see it's just impacting that small bit of the foreground. But when I start increasing the depth, it's basically dragging that higher and higher into the photo to where it gets to basically about the midpoint of the photo. Now I would pull that down, but it's a great way to quickly add a little bit of brightening to a foreground element. So if I show you the before and the after, it's a great way to do that. And while I'm at it, it's also, it works above the fold, so to speak. So I could increase a brightness in the sky if I wanted, which I don't, because a minute ago I darkened it. Well, I could come in and darken it further by doing something like dragging the brightness far, which is further into the photo. So basically the upper half of the photo, drag that to the left to darken it and drag the brightness near to the right to brighten it. And you can quickly make a huge impact on the light distribution in your image. So before and after, I mean, I've almost nearly flipped the, the light distribution. It's probably a little too much, so I maybe uh, wouldn't go that far, but it's a good demo of how quickly a tool like this can really help you impact the light in an image. And, uh, you know, maybe something like that's a little bit more realistic. But again, quick, powerful edit from really bright. You might look at that frame. And in fact, I was shooting brackets. This was downtown one morning in Austin. I was shooting brackets, and this was actually um, one of the brighter exposures from a, from a three-exposure bracket set. And I just thought, hey, why not just use this one? Because you look at it, you might think it's too bright to use. And uh, in reality, it's not. In fact, it's probably a little bit dark now. So I could just come back and slightly brighten that overall if I wanted to. By the way, I didn't point this out, but you can always go into where it says edits here, click on that, and you can see all the tools. This is the overall exposure increase that I just did. You can see all the different tools that you used on any photo, and you can go back in time. So this is like a history panel. You can go back in time and further refine that specific tool. If I wanted to change the amount of Accent AI, I could just go click back into that and do that, and then... Um, go back and uh, you know adjust the photo overall. So just a, one more quick edit there, but just a, just a quick demo of the kind of things that you can do. So how's that, Derek? Are we okay on time? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We'll give it another minute to see if anybody has uh, any lingering questions. And Jim, why don't you remind everybody where they can find all your work? And I'll remind them that Jim has a YouTube channel on all this stuff, so be sure to go check that out as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, if you're interested in... Uh, you know, getting a free presets and a free ebook about Luminar Neo. It's full of tips, tricks, things like that. Uh, that's on my website. Just uh, I do ask that you set, uh, sub to my newsletter just on gymnix.com. And I send it out about once a week, sometimes every uh, maybe two or three times a month at the most. Um, and I share tips and tricks and ideas as well about how to make your photos, uh, you know, make editing changes to your photos using different tools, uh, mostly talking about Luminar Neo, of course. Uh, and as Derek said, I'm on YouTube. I share a couple of videos a week using uh, Luminar and sometimes some other tools where I'm just coming in and doing edits and just showing you how you can make changes to your photos based on whatever it is, you know, so I might do some photo uh, edit workflows like this, but yeah, I do those kind of things. And then of course, I've got a Facebook page, Jim Next Photography. I've got an Instagram page, uh, you know, all the usual places that you can find people these days. I'm, I'm there too. So feel free to follow along and, uh, I appreciate everybody hanging out today. It was a lot of fun for me. I love doing this kind of stuff. I love the interaction. So thank you for the questions. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's it, Derek. Awesome. And another easy place to find Jim is right here on the event space as we're going to be having him back as part of awesome. the Nelly's Art of Photography series. So if you guys want to stay tuned to that in a couple of weeks, we're going to be seeing Jim again. And uh, hopefully if he hasn't gotten sick of us, we'll get him <laughs> back to to return either I'm hoping up here in New York, maybe we could yeah. do another, uh, another New York two shot thing. So. Hey, that was fun. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, happy to come back. It's a great city for photography and uh, hanging out with folks like yourself. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I look forward to that. And yeah, uh, August 2nd, I think it is with, uh, with Vanelli uh, for, uh, for, uh, I'll be talking about the art of the cityscape and I'll be doing some, uh, some cityscape edits. So that'll be fun. Awesome. Well, Jim, we're looking forward to it. A huge thank you to you for this two-part series, as well as the Skylum Luminar team and to all of our viewers out there. Thank you, guys. But that's all we got for right now. Another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space is in the books. We'll catch you all next time.